Hello and welcome to another fun-filled edition of Adam's Music Box, where once again I forget to put the microphone in front of me, a problem that has just been solved. Uh, but uh, that almost sounds like a really bad version of a Rush lyric. But we are going to talk about Rush today. And specifically, we're going to talk about Neil Peart. I always have to double check the pronunciation, even though because we're about 30 years, I'd called him Peart. But there you go. It's Neil Peart. And whatever you call him, he's usually called one of the best drummers of all time. And to understand why that is, we need to understand the anatomy of modern drumming psychology, if you will. Now, the modern drum set, as we know it, was really something that came of age, and I would say even was invented in its most notable form in the world of American jazz. Um, other instruments get their notoriety in other genres. The violin is played across many genres, but it's probably most associated with European classical music. Saxophone is also most associated with jazz. That was It was invented uh, almost a century before the word jazz or that style even came to exist. Um, and other instruments, the electric guitar is almost always associated with rock and roll. Um, and so because of that, the drums really are an instrument where if you really want to understand them and if you really want to play them well, you have to understand at least something about jazz. And when you look at it, most of the great early rock drummers uh, were people that were heavily influenced by jazz. Ginger Baker never even called himself a rock drummer, always referred to himself as a jazz drummer. Mitch Mitchell from the Jimi Hendrix experience experience. His style of drumming was just jazz, but played louder <laughs> to keep up with the sort of Jimi Hendrix sound and that vibe. John Bonham gushing with jazz. John Bonham was truly a jazz drummer who adapted that style to rock more successfully um, than almost any other. Carl Palmer, a great drummer with the LP. Definitely Buddy Rich influenced Bill Bruford, another one of these great progressive rock drummers. He'll tell you that he was, he always considered himself, <coughs> pardon me, a jazz drummer who sort of accidentally found his way into rock bands. And Neil Peart obviously grew up with some of the same influences that these drummers did. But there was something different about Neil because Neil didn't improvise at the drums, which is very, which is unheard of in jazz. <laughs> In jazz, the drummer might be expected to read the chords so that he can understand the vibe of the song, but everything that the drummer plays in jazz is thought of spontaneously, the solos and everything else. Well, Neil Peart, or I did it again, Neil Peart invented a different way of conceiving the drums, one that I think is much more associated with what other instruments do in the context of your average rock band than in your average jazz band. And by average, I just I mean typical. I'm not referring to the level of quality. Obviously, Rush were virtuosos, all three of them. Um, but the idea of composing a drum part is something that was really unknown unless you were composing for percussion in the context of modern orchestral music or modern chamber music. But the idea that you'd go on stage in a club with a jazz band or a rock band and have a drum part that was composed simply wasn't done. I'm sure some people who are lesser known did it before Neil Peart, but Neil was the first person who was widely known and widely widely beloved to do that. Um, the results were very interesting because the drums ended up serving a very different function than they do in other ensembles and in other situations. Now, typically, um, the percussion is there to add melody and rhythm simultaneously. All of the great drummers have a keen understanding of melody, because if a drummer only understands rhythm alone, he's quite mediocre. The truly great ones understand both and are able to communicate both simultaneously. Tony Williams, I think the finest drummer ever from a jazz background, he had that wonderful understanding. Um, all of the great ones, Barnum, Billy Cobham, Alphonse Mousson, the list goes on, Art Blakey, they were all able to do that. Bill Bruford. Um, now, Neil 
did something different. Neil's drums weren't just about the melody, they were about the structure of the song. In other words, his drumming served more like the chords than like the melody, because melody is something that can only happen once you've established a chord structure, uh, where chords can exist on their own. They're the foundation on which all Western, at least, meaning European derived, and, and that may mean, you know, North American, etc. That's where all the song, the composition less rests. It's the foundation. It's the wheels on the vehicle. And Neil's drumming was really the equivalent of chords, percussive chords, because without Neil's drumming, the songs wouldn't be the songs, which is why you could try, and it would be interesting to come from a jazz perspective and just sit in on a Rush song. Obviously, you'd need to know the song because there's so many different key and tempo changes, uh, but it just wouldn't be the same song. It might be interesting, uh, but it wouldn't be the same. That's why when people cover a Rush uh, a Rush tune, they're always playing the drums exactly as Neil did because they, well, they're trying at least, because this was an implicit part of the composition. And even his solos were composed. Much later in life, um, he actually got back into jazz and he took some lessons at an age when most people don't to develop a different kind of technique. But through most of his career, he was exclusively reliant on the idea of the drums as an instrument for which he composed. And I think that it's this more than any other reason that he's remembered as being such a unique drummer. Because once you get really into the rabbit hole of drummers with great technique, you realize that there are a lot of them. Of course, there are more drummers with bad technique, but I already named a lot of them with great technique. And yet, what makes them different? What makes an Alphonse Mouzon different from a Billy Cobham, from a Lenny White, from a Bill Bruford, uh, from a John Bonham? What makes someone like Ringo or someone like Keith Moon considered interesting drummers, even though the technique isn't like some of those others? These are all questions that we ask. Uh, but when it comes to a drummer that actually composes for the drums, Neil was a trailblazer in the realm of the kind of music that he played. And he did really interesting things with it. That's why, for instance, that some of the drum compositions that Neil made are as memorable as a riff. He was writing, again, drum riffs, drum chords. And this above and beyond his exquisite technique were what made him very, very interesting. And it also probably explains why he appeared so intense when he was playing, because normally a drummer can kind of wing it and we'll see what happens. But with him, it was, this is the composition. And if I screw up, it's going to affect the architecture of the composition that the other musicians on stage are playing with me. Very interesting, very different, radical, frankly, in the context of any rock, whether progressive or otherwise. So that is, to me, from the drumming perspective, his greatest legacy. Like, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Take care.